Can we just praise the Lord together? That is a good recap. Man, I'm so excited what God's done and doing in our church. It is a privilege for me to get to serve in a church like this where I get to be a part and have a front row seat of God moving in so many incredible ways. Um, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, I'm Tony Walliser. I'm one of the pastors here at Silverdale, and I get the privilege each week of sharing with you God's Word. So go and take your Bibles, open up the New Testament to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and then do this as well. Take out these Bible study outlines where you can follow along and take notes as we study God's Word together. Today, I want to talk to you about completing the vision. Last week, I shared with you that way back in 2018, I had shared with the congregation our 2020 vision. And, and basically, we were going to take on four really huge you know, tasks and projects in order that we may make room for more people in our congregation, that we would break down walls in order to reach this city more effectively for Jesus Christ. And what's been amazing is that so many of you caught that vision. And you've given like maybe you've never given before, and you prayed maybe like you never prayed before. And we go and we share the gospel. And we've seen more people come to faith in the last 24 months than we had in any other period of time in our church history. It's just been amazing what God's done. Now, let me give you a little details, specifics of all that. The, the four projects that we took on, they cost about $7 million, which is a huge number for any of us to think about. But here's the amazing thing. You and your generosity over the last 24 months, you've given a little over $5 million to our 2020 vision. So that's incredible. What does that mean? That means that we have a little less than $1.8 million so that we can complete our 2020 vision. And so that's what I'm asking you to do. Will you just take the next 12 months and just pray and ask God, God, what do you want me to give above my normal tithes and offerings to reach 2020 so that we can complete this vision? Now, I share that and I lay it out there for you to pray about, but I know that some people, you know, just get a push back and go, Pastor Tony's here, he's gonna ask us for money. Well, I mean, a couple of things about that. Number one, I rarely talk about and teach on giving. And part of the reason why is because early on, um, when I was young in the ministry, I, I just felt intimidated by it. I thought I didn't want to, you know, offend anybody and talk about money or talk about giving. And so I, I really avoided passages that dealt with it. But the older I've gotten, and hopefully the wiser I've gotten, I realized something. That this is all through the scriptures, and this is a big deal to God that part of our Christian faith and growing in our Christian faith is understanding how we give generously to his kingdom. And so we can't avoid it. If this is the year of growing up, this is a big deal. This thing right here, giving to God's kingdom, may be a primary way that God will grow you up in your faith. In fact, did you know that Jesus talks more about money than any other topic? He does. I mean, Jesus talks more about money than he does heaven and hell combined. Why? Because he knows that whatever's got your heart has got you. In fact, look at how he puts this. Jesus says this in John chapter 6, verse 24. Jesus says this. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other, you cannot serve both God and money. You go, well, what's he talking about there? Basically, Jesus is saying this. Jesus is saying, if you call me Lord, you're going to give to my kingdom. Now, again, a lot of people can call Jesus Lord. You can say that you believe and hope that you go to heaven when you die, but if you don't give to God's kingdom, something's wrong with that. Your, your faith, something's flawed. I mean, again, I hope that you go to heaven. I really do. But the fact is, you cannot say you're submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ and you don't give to his kingdom. The two just don't go together. Why? Because Jesus knows all you can do, follow the money. Whatever's got your heart has you. And so whenever you come to faith and you're surrendered to Christ, it does affect the way you spend your money. And in fact, look at how Jesus put this. And Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I've seen this hundreds of times in people's lives, that whenever God finally gets a, a, a hold of somebody's heart, it changes them. It changes the way they live, the way they talk, the way they act. It changes the way they spend money. 
And so what I want to do today is we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm going to give you, and I'm going to show you the principles of how to have joy in generosity. And, and in fact, these principles will be life-altering. They will radically change your, your life. I mean, and, and it's not, I'm not just teaching this just so, you know, you can, you know, give to the one-year challenge and we can, you know, reach our 2020 goal. But I want this to be a part of your lifestyle. So as we study 2 Corinthians chapter 9, let me set this up for you, okay? Let me give you a little background of what's actually taking place. The Apostle Paul, he is the, the apostle to the Gentiles. And the Jerusalem church is made up of Jews, and they believe Jesus is the Messiah, but now they're coming under intense persecution, I mean, basically, they're being blackballed, their businesses are being, you know, just, you know, ostracized, and so you got these Christians that are struggling in Jerusalem, and then you have a famine that comes through, and they are really financially struggling. And so the Apostle Paul hears this, and he says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask all the churches in um, Asia Minor and Europe that we'd all come together, we'd come and come up with a big offering and I'm going to take it to Jerusalem and we're going to bless the Jerusalem church. And so that, that's the whole context of what this passage is all about. But what's really cool is that in this context, Paul then tells us the blessedness of generosity. Paul then tells us why we should be motivated to give to God's kingdom. And so I want you to jot on your outline four principles that will literally rock your world, change your life if you apply them. Number one is this. First of all, generosity unlocks the laws of the harvest. Generosity unlocks the law of the harvest. That's how he starts this passage off. Look at it in verse 6. Paul says, the point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Now, this is common sense, right? I mean, if the more you sow, the more you plant, the more you're going to reap. That makes sense. Uh, I mean, we, we understand that a guy who plants five acres, he can't expect to reap the same harvest of the guy that plants 5,000 acres, right? The more you plant, the more you're going to reap. But most of us, we didn't grow up in an agrarian society with farming in our mind. And so let me just put it down to where we live. Most of you have probably had a tomato plant before in your life, right? Well, let's just imagine this. Who's going to get the most tomatoes? The guy who plants three tomato plants or the guy who plants 30 tomato plants? All things being equal, the guy who plants the 30 is going to reap more of the harvest, right? Well, that's what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying, hey, this laws of the harvest, it's not just true in the physical realm, in agriculture. It's true in your life spiritually. You go, what? Yeah, that's what Paul's doing here. Paul's saying that the principles of the law of the harvest apply to our finances. Now, this is revolutionary. Now, this is repeated over and over again in the scriptures. Let me give you another passage. Um, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24 puts it like this. He writes, one gives freely, yet he grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give only to suffer want. You go, wait a minute, this just sort of defies logic. The person who gives money away is getting richer, and the person that is miserly and hangs on to his money, he's always poor and always struggling financially? Yes. Why? Because they haven't learned the principle of the harvest. God sees this. God has set this thing up. God says, when you give to my kingdom and bless others, guess what? I will get involved in your finances. Now, this takes a great deal of faith because logically it doesn't make sense to us. Let me illustrate it like this. I had an uncle. He's already gone on to be with the Lord. Uncle Pete, he lived in North Florida. And he had a farm. And on that farm, he had a, um, an old hand pump sort of like this. And if you've ever seen those before, you know those old hand pumps, you can pump and pump and pump and pump and nothing will come out. And so what you gotta do is you gotta take some water and you gotta pour it down the pipe and it, it basically moistens the seal and then whenever you pump, out will come all of this fresh, great, you know, um, cold water, okay? But it takes a great deal of faith to take the water and dump it down. Now imagine for a second that you're in a desert, Imagine for a second that, you know what, you're in a desert and you are so thirsty and you're dry and you come upon that pump. You are then caught in a dilemma. 
what do I do? I can drink this hot, stale water and partially satisfy my thirst, or by faith, I can pour it down the pipe and start pumping and get all the fresh water I can ever imagine drinking. Do you understand? It requires a great deal of faith. Well, that's what it is. Whenever you give to God's kingdom, it requires faith. See, some people will say, Pastor Tony, I'd love to give, but I can't afford to give. You can't afford not to give. I mean, if you really want to understand, and that's why so many Christians do not experience miracles of financial miracles in their life, because they've never actually stepped out in faith and said, okay, God, I'm going to believe what you say in your word. I'm going to trust you financially. And so, first principle Paul gives is, okay, it unlocks the laws of the harvest whenever you give generously to his kingdom. Second thing that it does is this, jot this down. Your generosity makes God happy. Your generosity makes God happy. Have you ever thought of that? Look at verse 7. It's a great verse. Paul says, each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or grudgingly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. In, in your outline, circle the word cheerful there. In Greek, it's, um, it means hilarion. You, what does that mean? We get the word hilarious from it. God, God loves a hilarious giver. God loves a joyful giver. You know, why does God love a joyful giver, a cheerful giver? Why is that? Because God is a cheerful giver. God is the most generous being in the universe. God is known and marked by his generosity. I mean, think of it. Greatest verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave. Our God is incredibly generous. And so God says, I want you to give with a joyful, happy spirit whenever you give. You go, does it really matter what motives we give? Well, I believe it does. And so what I've done is on your outline, I've put in this little box there some of the motives for giving. Three of them are wrong. One of them is correct. And so let's talk about it just for a second. The first one is, okay, you can give with a bad motive. You can get with a bad motive. You go, what is a bad motive? Well, that's you give in order to get, right? There's a whole um, doctrine that's permeated the American church. It's called the prosperity gospel. I think 18% of Christians in America believe the prosperity gospel. And it basically says this, you give to God and he's going to make you wealthy. You're going to be rich. You're going to have not just what you need. You're going to have mansions. You're going to have a car. I mean, it's an incredible car. You just by faith give. God's going to, he's going to make you rich. That's the prosperity gospel. Now, Paul's saying, hey, that's the wrong motive. You know, in fact, what I see it, I see it as a spiritual Ponzi scheme. Because what you have, you have these television preachers, not all of them, but many of them, they'll say, give to my ministry, and God's going to bless you a hundredfold, Right? And what do they do? They take passages like we're studying right now, and they, they twist them. They, they take it a little bit farther than what God says. Listen, God has promised to get involved in your um, finances, not so you're going to be rich. Check me, right? God's promised to care for your needs so that you'll be generous. See, if you think you're going to manipulate God and make him your spiritual genie, you're, you're worshiping the wrong God, Okay? He's not your spiritual slot machine. That's the wrong motive. In fact, the Apostle Paul warns us of the prosperity gospel. He says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5. He says this. They imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. They think, okay, I can, I can give these laws of the harvest and I can, I can manipulate God to bless me a certain way. Well, no, you're, you're given with the wrong motive. That's a bad motive. There's also another motive. You can give with a mad motive. You go, mad motive, what is that? That's where you give, but you go, oh, you give grudgingly. Ah, oh, okay, I got to give. Bible says I got to give. Pastor Tony says I should give. All right, I'll give. I mean, and basically, you give to the kingdom, and it's like paying taxes. You don't want to. Okay, I got to. Well, does it really matter how you give? I think it does. And in fact, let me illustrate it like this, okay? Guys, Valentine's Day is just a few weeks away, right? Little heads up, right? And um, let's just say that Romeo, this guy, he comes home and he's bought a Valentine's gift, but he doesn't have a lot of money and he begrudged having to buy her a gift. And so he doesn't even wrap it. He's still in the package. He throws it on the table and says, there, happy Valentine's Day. 
I didn't have the money for that, but I knew if I didn't buy you a Valentine's gift, I'd never hear the end of it. So there it is. Well, it don't matter what he bought. He just ruined it, didn't he? Right? Right? Now, you just take it this way. Let's just say that it's the same guy, same situation, but he has a different attitude. What does he do? He buys the gift, he wraps it, and then he even writes a note to give to her. And the note sounds something like this. Baby doll. <laughs> There's no way in the world that this gift tells you the value and the worth that you are to me. It's a small token of how much I love you and appreciate you. And I hope that one day I can give you so much more. But know that this gift is my way of saying, I love you, be my Valentine. Now ladies, who would you rather be with, right? <laughs> Does your motive matter? Of course it matters. God doesn't want you to be a mad giver. Also, God doesn't want you to be a sad giver. That you always regret. Ah, okay. You know what? Paul says under compulsion. Okay, I, I give it, man. I regret giving to the church, right? Have you ever been a sad giver before? I mean, I, I, I've been a sad giver before. I mean, there's been times I've been driving a stop at a red light. And then you've seen it before. These kids come to you, maybe they're wearing a ball cap and they got a bucket and they're raising money so that their team can play in the nationals, right, kind of thing. And they come and they go, big smile, please give, right? And you're feeling, under, you're under compulsion at that moment, aren't you? You know, you got a little bit of time and so you say, sure, whatever. So you roll down your window, you open up your wallet, you're looking for a couple of ones, maybe a five, and all you got is a 20. And you go, oh my goodness. I mean, I'm under pressure. The kid's right there, he's smiling, he's saying, please. And so what do you do? You put a 20 in the bucket, the light changes, you drive away, and you go, ah, can't believe I gave $20 to that kid, right? That could have been lunch, right? That is a sad giver. God doesn't want you to be a sad giver. He doesn't want you to be a mad giver. He doesn't want you to be a bad giver. What does he want you to do? He wants you to be a glad giver. God loves a cheerful giver. You go, how do I become a cheerful giver? Well, can I just be honest? It doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. Paul puts it this way. Paul says, each person should do as he's decided in his heart. You go, what does that mean? Well, let me illustrate it like this, okay? So I just said, at the beginning of my message, all right, we're in our last year of our 2020 vision, and we need $1.8 million. Will you please pray, ask the Lord what God wants you to give toward our 2020 vision, right? And so what do you do? You sincerely pray. You say, God, do you want me to give to this? And he'll say yes or no. And then if he says yes, you say, okay, God, what do you want me to give? How much? What, what sacrifice do you want me to make in order to, to make this happen? And then God will tell you through his Holy Spirit, he'll prompt you. And then guess what? Whenever you hear God speak to you, and by faith you give that, you experience joy. You really do, because it's done out of obedience to the Lord. Growing up, we used to sing an old hymn called Trust and Obey. I don't know if you've ever heard that hymn before. But it goes, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And it's true. You, you want to be happy in Jesus? It's just that simple. It's trust and obey. Okay, God, I'm going to trust you. You've called me to do this. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to trust you. And suddenly you find joy in giving to his kingdom. There, there's a great example of this in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 35, you have Moses. He's telling the people of God, all right, we're going to build this tabernacle. And we, we want to build it with free will offerings. So just pray and ask God what you're to contribute to it. And look at what the Bible says. In Exodus 35, 21, the Bible says, everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work. You see, they gave because God told them, that God stirred their heart. And it's the same way with you. Whenever God's spirit convicts you and shows you and stirs your heart to give, do it. And whenever you do that, suddenly you find yourself this is joyous. This is amazing. I get to be a part of what God's doing. And so, first principle, generosity opens the laws of the harvest. Generosity makes God happy. Third principle is this. Jot this down. Generosity invites God's favor. Generosity invites God's favor. God opens the windows of heaven on you. 
Look at how Paul says this, okay? Verse 8, it's an amazing promise. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you will excel in every good work. And here, Alan, circle God is able. Can I just tell you something? God's able to do that promise there. God's able. It doesn't say Wall Street's able or the government's able or your boss is able or, you know, the economy's able or you know, the bank is able or you're able. No, it says God is able. That even in economic difficult times, our God is still on the throne and he's able to do this. Able to do what? Well, in that one verse, verse 8 is one of the greatest giving promises in the Bible. In that one verse, there's five times that Paul says all or every. He basically says, in every way, in every need, at every time, for every good work, God's going to do it. Look at it, verse 8. It's an incredible verse. And God is able, look at it, to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. Do you see that? In every way, in every need, in every good work, God's going to provide for you. Do you know what you call that? I call that financial security. That's what I call that. That I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about the economy. I don't have to worry about tomorrow. Why? Because God's promise, he's going to take care of my needs in every way. Now, it doesn't say that God's going to take care of all my wants, but God's promises, he's going to take care of all of my needs. That's an incredible promise, and that's because of generosity. You give to the Lord, God promises to take care of all your needs. Now, can I tell you something? You can't claim that promise if you're not generous to God's kingdom. You can't. You see, when you don't give to the Lord and his church and his kingdom, in essence, you have a presupposition. This is what you're saying. You're saying, God, by me not giving to your kingdom and me keeping that money and spending it how I want to spend it on myself, I'm positioning myself that whenever difficult financial times come in my life, I don't need you, God. Now, none of us would ever say that aloud, but that's really what you're saying. You're saying, God, I'm not going to give to your kingdom. I'm going to spend money just on me. I'm not going to trust you. I'm going to spend it my way. And you know what? I'm just going to believe that I'll handle it on my own. But you know, this is what I often see. People that haven't been trusted in the Lord financially, they come upon a real difficult financial time, and what do they do? They cry out, oh, God, please help me. Right? It's hypocritical, but that's exactly what they do. And see, so many Christians, because they haven't learned to trust God in this most basic area of life, your finances, because they haven't learned to trust God in this most basic area of life, they don't see financial miracles. But I've seen thousands of financial miracles. Why? Because I've learned to trust God and his word. God's going to take care of our needs. Paul continues. Look what he says in verse 10. He says this, as it's written, he distributes freely, talking about God, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now the one who provides seed for the sower, that's God, and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. That means you're not only harvesting financial, God's giving you spiritual blessings. Why? Verse 11, this is a great verse. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity. Why is God going to enrich you? Why is God going to do that? So you can spend that money on yourself? No. He's going to enrich you for all generosity. See, God is looking for people that trust him. And God says, I will enrich them. Why? So that they can be more and more generous. You've heard me say this before. And it's this that God doesn't give you raises to raise your standard of living. No, God gives you raises to raise your standard of giving. Does that make sense? See, so many of us in our materialistic society of America, we think, okay, it's all for me, all my blessings are for me. No, God doesn't want you to be a cul-de-sac of his blessings. He wants you to be a conduit through which he can bless you. God wants you to flow with the blessings. He doesn't want the blessings to be a dead end. I mean, just because, let's say, you, you and your spouse have a combined income of whatever, 60000 or 7000 or 80000 that doesn't mean you need to live an $80,000 lifestyle. You can say, okay, God, how much is enough? This is, all, this is my lifestyle, and I'm going to try to give everything above that. 
And God says, I'm looking for people that will be, um, you know, trust me in those ways. Let me illustrate it like this. I have several buckets here to illustrate what I'm talking about here. This one obviously represents God's, you know, resources. This little one right here is my resources. And this right here is, okay, church ministries. And so what does the Bible say? The Bible says that God blesses us. I mean, the Bible says that every good and perfect gift that you have is from God. So I hope you understand that any blessings that you have, God is the one who's given those to you. In fact, Paul in another place asked a question. What do you have that you didn't receive from the Lord? Everything you have is from God, okay? So here's your resources, right? And then what do you do? You say, okay, God, um, you want me to be generous. You want me to give to your kingdom. So I'm gonna take a portion of what you've given me and I'm gonna give to your kingdom. And God sees that. And what does Paul say? Okay, you, based on what you sow, you're gonna reap. What does Paul say? All things at all times for all your needs, God is going to pour into you. There it is. And you go, wow, God took care of us. God provided for our needs. Do we stop there? No, of course not. We go, okay, God, I'm gonna trust you even more. I'm gonna give a little bit more to your kingdom. Give it there, I'm gonna trust you more. And God says, game on. You ain't out giving me, and I'm gonna give even more. Why? Because God says, I'm looking for somebody who will trust me. Can I tell you something? This works. I have been a Christian now for 37 years. I became a Christian at 20 years old. I've always tithed. I've always given to the Lord. Why? Because that's what the Word of God told me to do. And I've seen God provide again and again and again, and miracles have taken place, and God's taken care of my needs. Listen, I'm not a rich person. I live in a middle-class neighborhood, but can I tell you this? I am a blessed person. I live under the favor of God. Every aspect of my life is blessed, and I have the favor of God, not because of me, but because of the promises of God's word. Listen, God is true to his word. You just gotta trust him. And so what's Paul saying? Paul's saying, will you be generous, give to his kingdom, why? Opens the laws of harvest, God is pleased with that, and not only that, it invites God's favor. I don't know about you, I want God's favor in my finances. Well, this invites it. But there's a fourth reason why Paul says we are to give. Jot this on your outline, number four is this. He says, generosity blesses other people. Generosity blesses other people. And so Paul, remember, why is he taking up this offering? So that the Jerusalem Christians will be taken care of and blessed. So look at what he says, verse 12. He says, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the proof of the pro- provided by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. And so what's Paul saying? Paul's saying, hey, whenever we've given this thing, it's gonna take care of their needs physically, but you know what? They're gonna be blessed spiritually. Their faith is going to be encouraged in the faith. Why? And they're gonna glorify God. Why? Because of you and your generosity. Well, that's the case here in our church. Our church is blessed because of the generosity of you, God's people, and God blesses your generosity. I mean, the reason why we, can, we have nine weekend worship services in four campuses is because you've given to the Lord. I mean, the reason why we have amazing children's ministry or student ministries is because you've trusted God. God blesses your finances. Or, you know, think about it. We have people on the other side of the planet who just last year had never heard the name of Jesus Christ, but now is calling on Jesus Christ as Lord, and it's because of you and your generosity. We have missionaries literally around the world because of your generosity. And as I mentioned, we are seeing more people come to faith in the last 24 months than we ever have. Why? Because that's a blessing of your generosity. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Now, I could give you hundreds of examples of how God's working. But I want you to just hear just one example of how God is taking the work and ministry of Silver Baptist Church and changing people's lives. Listen to the story of Sandy. 
One night, we were having, our family was having dinner at Cracker Barrel, and we were, I'll never forget, we were sitting at one of those round tables, and we had a server that was very sweet and engaging. We were all laughing with her, and it was just a neat time together. And I don't always do this, but it was about time for us to have the blessing. And I just asked her, is there anything that we can pray for you with about? And she grabbed our hands, so we're all in this round circle, grabbed hands, and I prayed for her. And then as soon as I said amen, she starts praying and prays a blessing over our family. As soon as I said amen, God just said to my heart, get to know her. As the months went on, I ended up finding out that she had been moved into government housing. So she had a home, but no furniture. So I really felt like that this would be a time that I could um, ask friends if they had some furniture or whatever to help her get her house um, furnished. Pastor Tony challenged us to all pray for our one. And I didn't really have to think too hard who to pray for because I'd already been praying for her. And as I started praying for her uh, for several months, she texted me one day and she had pretty much hit rock bottom. Um, and I believe that God used that time to really get her attention. And she realized that she couldn't do anything, do all of this on her own anymore. And then all those times I had been inviting her to church for the last two years and she wouldn't come, now she was ready to come. And so it was um, Easter of uh, last year and she did come. We, uh, she loved sitting up in the balcony um, because she loved, to, she loved the music. And God just used that whole time to draw her to Him. And she uh, walked down and accepted Jesus that day on Easter of 2019. In November, um, she was able to be baptized. Um, I tell her all the time um, she, that she is a daughter of the King and that God is gonna use her in great and mighty ways. She ended up telling me one day that um, she wanted to serve and do something for God, um, but she wasn't real sure what it was. And as she started praying about it, God reminded her of where she had come from. And she uh, loved to bake, and so she started making homemade goodies. And she told me she really wanted to have a ministry to the homeless. Um, and she got in her car that had not worked in two or three weeks, turned the key, and it worked. And he took her, he showed her some areas of the homeless that most people don't go to. And she just said, I just wanted to let you know that Jesus loves you and he wanted me to bring you, bring you these goodies. What started off as, I believe, as a ministry to someone was really God was using it to change my heart. Hey Amen. I love, again, stories like that. I just That's the power of the gospel. That's the influence and impact of our church that you make whenever you give to God's kingdom. And so let me end this way. I started out, I just said, hey, 2020 vision. We want to complete that this year. And so I'm just asking all of you to pray, God, what do you want me to give? Over the next 12 months, what do you want to give? And you know what? Whatever God says to you is going to be perfect because God knows exactly what you need. God knows exactly what we need as a church. And so just pray and ask the Lord. I, I know that um, that's what Susan and I did. I mean, by the grace of God, um, Susan and I paid off our house in December. We've lived there for 25 um, years. Hallelujah. Finally, we paid off the mortgage. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's awesome. That's a cool thing. Okay. And, um, and so as I'm praying, God, what do you want me to give in 2020 toward reach? And God said, Tony, the amount you've been given the mortgage, give that to my kingdom. And I said, absolutely. And it's joyous. Why? Because when you see God move and work again and again and again, it's a joy to be able to give to God's kingdom. And so in the next week or so, pray. You'll probably get something in the mail, just something like this, just asking you to pray and, and just hear from the Lord, whatever that may be. And on February 2nd, all of us are going to come together and we're going to say, this is what we feel like God's asking us to give over the next 12 months. And we're just going to present it to the Lord. And we're going to trust God that he's going to continue to do supernatural things in and through our body. Well, folks, again, thank you for being here. And my prayer is how Paul ended this passage. May God enrich you in every way. Why? For your generosity. 
God wants you to be generous, and he'll enrich you so you can be generous.